Okay, well, I, I'm Thomas Small. I'm, I'm your mayor uh, and <laughs> delighted to be with you here tonight. Um, and we, we are exceptionally fortunate uh, to have Manuel Pastor speaking to us tonight. The, uh, the more we look into our general plan uh, that we're, we're working on, that we're beginning to work on right now, we, we see that it really is the, the constitution, the, the, uh, it tells us the shape of, what, of, of our city that is to come in the future. And, and we've known for a while how, how those of us who've been working on it on the inside, how important it is. It's certainly, you know, in many ways, maybe the most important thing we'll be doing as a city government, uh, you know, maybe this decade in some ways. And, and as we look at it more, close, more closely, and we look at what's happening in our city and around us, we, we are, we're coming to understand that equity, inclusion, um, may well be the most important aspect of it. Uh, and so that, that really brings the focus on tonight and on, on Manuel Pastor's work. Uh, because he is, he is one of the people, I think, that is doing some of the most important work on this issue. And we're extremely fortunate that he's here at USC uh, and, that, and that we could get him here tonight. The, the last time that I saw him speak, uh, I think, was at the Urbanism Next conference up in Portland a number of months ago. And I think there were about 700 people in the room, um, and the room was packed. So uh, that's just that's just a, a little inkling of of how important his work is, and and how how uh, what a great thing it is that we have him here tonight in this small group talking about our city. And when I look about look at what he's going to talk about, I think it's certainly some of the it's going to be some of the stuff that uh, that that I most need to hear, and those those folks that are helping us work on this. So. Um, without further ado, please welcome Manuel, pa Dr. Manuel Pastor. Thank you. Um, so this is probably going to run out of battery very soon. Uh, so let me, uh, if we can get the other one ready. Um, or at least that's probably what the red light means. Uh, so I actually uh, am a professor, but I feel like a technician tonight because I've uh, made the projector work, got the mics to go. Uh, I'm like feel like a junior AV guy, uh, which probably makes sense being in school. Um, so I'm going to uh, talk to you tonight about sort of 10 uh, basic kind of big trends to kind of keep in mind as you start thinking about uh, planning for a more inclusive uh, city. I'm, there are probably more than 10 trends, but nobody can remember more than 10 things. Uh, and you may not even remember these, so uh, I'll try to make it as lively as possible as we go along. Um, I always like to let people know, uh, Tom having heard me before, by the way, I noticed what great mayoral authority you had when you asked everyone to sit down and no one did. So. Uh, <laughs> If that's a sign of uh, the plan to come, we'll, we'll see. Uh, but I always like to let people know, Tom, I think it's heard this, that when I speak, that if my voice uh, breaks or sort of tires out, uh, it's not that I'm emotional being with you in Culver City, although uh, what better way to spend a, a Thursday night. Uh, it's that I have a voice condition that's called spasmodic dysphonia, spasms around the voice box. Diane Rehm on NPR used to have it, so your voice can, can break or crack. Uh, and actually, this is true. Uh, it gets treated once a month with Botox, <laughs> because that's how we treat everything in Los Angeles. It just uh, completely works for us. So uh, I want to talk to you about uh, uh, 10 key trends. And I'm going to go through them pretty quickly. There's a bunch of slides. I'll make them available so you can put them someplace on the web, um, et cetera. Uh, several of them are demographic. Several of them are economic. Several of them are sort of social. Uh, and then I'll kind of come back with one uh, bigger overarching trend. So on the demographic uh, trend, a kind of key thing uh, to realize is that uh, there's actually, while people think about a lot of demographic change, it's actually slowing down. So why do people think there's a lot of demographic change going on? If you look at the United States uh, from uh, this is from 1980 to 2050, 
you could see a little bit of the anxiety that drove the national election in 2016, which is that the United States is projected to become majority people of color by about the year 2043, 2044. Now, for those of us in Los Angeles, we think that's great. That just means more Korean taco trucks all over uh, the United States. What could be wrong with that? But of course, that's creating a lot of anxiety. And for most people, what they think is that what's going to go on is that the US, as it moves uh, to become majority people of color, that it's all going to occur in California, right? That California will become 150% Latino. <laughs> They'll be sort of super uh, Chicanos uh, marching the earth. Uh, Culver City will be renamed La Ciudad del Culver. Uh, <laughs> But that's not the case. Uh, although the name change might happen, that could be a good part of the general plan. Uh, <laughs> so if you look at the demographic change in the United States between 2000 and 2050, 69% uh, non-Hispanic white to be a 47% non-Hispanic white, that's basically what California went through between 1980 and 2000. We were California, we were, California was America fast forward. But in fact, our demographic change is slowing down in the state. Uh, and as you can see that moving forward, the Latino population, the blue group, is projected to increase its share, but actually not very much. And this is particularly true in Los Angeles County. So if you look at Los Angeles County, which actually became majority people of color about uh, before 1990, uh, that as you project it forward, we're actually seen our demographic change very much slow down and stabilize. So when you look around and ask what's the LA County of the future, a lot of it's the LA County of today. And here's a really interesting demographic statistic for you to know, because by the way, if you know demographic statistics, people will bum rush you at cocktail parties, because uh, it makes you a very charming uh, conversationalist. And people will bring you little drinks with umbrellas saying, can you please tell me another demographic statistic? So the only large metropolitan area in the United States that in the last 10 years did not see an increase in the number of Hispanic children, Los Angeles County. Because our demographic uh, trends are slowing down. Our Latino population is more likely, if they're immigrants who have been here a very long time, or to be US born, which means the fertility and family formation rates are getting closer to the US norm. Uh, and uh, so, but what does that look like in Culver City? We can't project for Culver City, but Culver City, which was a largely white place um, in 1970, went through a big demographic transition. But what's fascinating about Culver City is your demographic change is essentially completely stabilized since the year 2000. You're one of the few places that's not becoming uh, more diverse, but still hanging on to this uh, significant white uh, population. Uh, now, again, what's driving the demographic change? If you were paying attention during the last election, uh, by which I hope in some sense you weren't, because it was a, a period in which sort of fact-free fancy became uh, kind of staple for the way people were thinking about things, you would have thought that what's driving uh, the demographic change in the United States is immigration. And in fact, that's not true. Immigration in the United States is stabilized. Immigration from Asia is outpacing immigration from Latin America. Uh, in our biggest send receiving places like LA, uh, our share of the foreign born is actually on the decline. And there are now more Mexicans returning to Mexico than coming to the United States, which is likely to continue to the future because of the reason for that is not so much enforcement at the border as it is that the fertility rates in Mexico have declined dramatically. Women are having less children. So more Mexicans returning to the United States, uh, returning to Mexico than coming to the United States, which I always say means that if we build a wall, we're just penning Mexicans in, which I'm, I'm pretty sure is not the intent of the administration, but we'll wind up uh, being the effect. So well, that does not mean, though, uh, we, we had a big uh, sort of immigrant shock in LA County. Uh, Los Angeles County in the 70s and 80s was absorbing nearly a quarter of the nation's immigrants came in through LA County. 
So we went through that change. Like the rest of the nation, we freaked out. Uh, but now it's very much stabilizing. Um, it has, however, left a legacy immigrant population. And the most important thing, I think, for LA County to be thinking about, and Culver City as part of it, is that while the national conversation is about immigration, that is flows of people into the country, the LA County conversation should be about immigrant integration. That is about making sure that immigrants are integrating successfully into the communities, which means civic participation, economic mobility, and receiving society openness. This is incredibly important because uh, about a third of LA County is foreign born. About half of our workforce is foreign born. 60% of our kids have at least one immigrant parent. And then the other thing that I think is really crucial about this, it affects Culver City as well, when people think about undocumented immigrants, they tend to <clears throat> think about someone who arrived recently, right? Who is standing in front of Home Depot, uh, selling their labor, uh, has sort of a light attachment to the country. That's not the case generally, and it's certainly not the case in LA. So if you go to Los Angeles County, we have about 900,000 undocumented immigrants in LA County. Uh, however, living with them is about another 850,000 US-born family members, mostly kids, but others as well. And then another 250,000 uh, lawful permanent residents who live with those undocumented family members. That means that about 20% of LA County's population is directly impacted by the potential for deportation because it will disrupt either their life or the life of their family. And another fact about that that really drives it home, and I would argue has led me to talk about this in a very different way, is that about two-thirds of undocumented immigrants in LA County have been here for a decade or longer. They're deeply settled into our labor markets, into our communities, et cetera. So we've started to talk about the undocumented immigrants in California as undocumented Californians. Deeply enmeshed, probably not gonna go anywhere because I think eventually we will have some kind of a legalization. Um, so let me uh, say a couple of, uh, kind of jump over these slides for time reasons, uh, including this one of Culver City. Uh, but say a couple of things about big picture that I'm trying to paint about the demography. So while the macro changes in some sense have slowed down, the sort of micro changes in a way have not. So neighbor, one of the really key things is that many suburban locales are seeing many more immigrants than they ever did before. It used to be mostly a city phenomena, but now, for example, one of the places that's rapidly getting immigrants is both the San Gabriel Valley with the Asian population, but also the San Fernando Valley, which has a rising immigrant and Latino population. In fact, these days, it's much more likely that the valley girl is La Muchacha del Valle. Uh, <laughs> she is, of course, still shopping at the mall, uh, but there's a little bit of uh, 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 merengue playing on her earbuds as she uh, purchases. So, uh, so, that's some of the interesting demographic ch changes, but there are a couple of different things that I think at closing out this demographic section that are key to thinking about for planning. So recall the demographic change is kind of slowing down. Uh, there's this group that's uh, kind of moved in, settled, uh, and perhaps unsurprisingly forming families. And one way to think about that is when we think about demography, we normally tend to think about ethnic change. So when I say demographic change, that's probably the first thing that comes to a lot of people's minds. But there's another part of this which is really key, uh, and it's the age structure. So if you look at the median age, uh, LA County, for non-Hispanic whites, it's 45. Median age means half older, half younger. If you look at the median age for Asian Pacific Islanders, 41. For African Americans, 38. For Latinos, the median age is 29. 
So 45, 29, 16 years, it's a generation gap. And it helps to explain two things. It helps to explain our continuing demographic shifts because when you're uh, 29, you're in prime family formation age. Uh, when you're 45, you think you're in prime family formation age, right? <laughs> uh, you may be Godspeed, right? I celebrate all families. Uh, uh, but it also helps to explain our politics. When you think about the politics writ large nationally, it's an older generation looking at a younger generation and not seeing itself. The state in the United States with the biggest racial generation gap is Arizona. With its fractious politics around immigration, ethnic studies in the schools, but also in the last eight years till this teacher strike, the largest cuts in per student spending in the K-12 system of any state in the United States. So one thing that's really critical when you start thinking about planning is the people, I mean, the median age in this room is probably not the median age of Culver City. But you have to be thinking about planning for another generation and another group of people who may not look like or be exactly like you. And that's the responsibility, in my view, of an older generation, of which I now proudly count myself. Uh, so I earned all these gray hairs. Um, and the, one of the reasons why that's uh, significant, uh, there's two reasons why it's significant. One is another great statistic. In the year 2010, 11% of Californians were above the age of 65. By the year 2050, 24% of Californians will be above the age of 65. So here's what's interesting about that. How many of you have kids? Great. How many of you would like your kids to do better than you? How many of you hope your kids do worse just to kind of teach them a lesson? <laughs> okay. So you better hope that your kids and everyone else's kids do about 60% better. Because that's the increase in the dependency ratio, the older folks who will be on Social Security and Medicare relative to those who will be in the working age population 25 to 64. So we need to repair this generational divide and we need to encourage investment in the next generation, partly out of the you know, good will that many of us might have, but it's an economic imperative moving forward as well. So, uh, and it's, there's one other thing which I think is, that, as you could tell, I like demography, I like a few other things too, and everything else will be a little bit shorter. But there's another thing that's really significant that helps to explain a little bit about what will happen in the state in the future. Um, which is, if you break down people who are born in California, who are still in California, between the ages of 25 and 45, kind of young, younger folks settling in. Uh, the group that has the most stickiness in the state is Asian Pacific Islanders and Latinos. The group that has the least stickiness in the state is whites. So young whites tend to move out of the state more than young Latinos or Asians or African Americans. If this does not make sense to you in your life, um, makes sense to me in mine. Every Latino kid I know, if they could get a job and stay in Los Angeles, would like view that as the crowning achievement of their life. There's a stickiness, a rootedness that's here, and that's going to also be important as you think about the future. So what are some of the economic realities, though, that are uh, facing people? So has this stuff been interesting so far? <laughs> Learning some stuff? Okay. Uh, so in the economic realities, I think there's sort of three uh, big trends that have to do with the growing inequality and dampened expectations, uh, the persistent racial gaps that will be problematic, particularly given the demographic change, and uh, housing, uh, which will be a big problem and one that you'll address in your plan. So uh, in terms of the economic inequality and economic uh, uncertainty, it's important to realize about Los Angeles that basically it had the 
uh, economic engine uh, kicked out of it in the early 1990s. This was an economy that people, when you, th when you think of major manufacturing centers, what comes to mind? Detroit, right? Chicago. And what you should know is that Los Angeles had the largest manufacturing sector of any metropolitan area in the United States in the 1980s. And it actually held onto it uh, for a much longer time than other places that began to deindustrialize. But when aerospace got kicked by the Cold War defense spending cutbacks, that rippled out through these communities, including Culver City, and it rippled out and stripped out uh, the manufacturing in South Los Angeles along the Alameda Corridor. Sort of the last props of industry that were there just really got kicked out. And the LA economy, in terms of employment, really has not recovered since. It's kind of fell down, and it uh, has been growing slower than the rest of the country. Um, the other thing about it um, has been that there's been a, a widening divide. And that widening divide, when we often think about it, we tend to think about it just with regard to like the 1% running away from uh, the rest of us in terms of CEO pay, financialization, et cetera. That is an issue. Um, it's a big issue, but it's a whole other talk uh, that I would uh, give to you. Uh, beneath that 1%, there's been a big change in the labor market experience. And the easiest way to remember this, and then I'll do the data, because uh, I think data needs stories, is I'm a professor. I make a lot more money than professors ever made because I can speak a couple of languages, I can deal with technology, I can apparently fix the AV at a school system. Uh, you know, I, can, I travel, I can talk, blah, 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 blah. My dad was a janitor. If my dad was alive, he would make a lot less money than janitors ever made. And that's what's going on in this chart. This plots people on the sort of distribution for full-time year-round workers. And those in the 90th and 80th percentile have seen their real wages rot over the last 30 years. Those who are at the bottom with less education have seen their real wages fall. And those in the middle have seen their real wages fall as well. What's interesting is that that's something that's gone on in the United States as a whole. That's the uh, plum bars. Uh, but it's gone on with steroids in Los Angeles. Another easy way to remember this, in 1969, uh, California was pretty much in the middle of the pack in terms of all states in the United States, in terms of income inequality. Half of the states were more equal, half of the states were less equal. We are kind of in the middle. Uh, this is the era in which I grew up. My family actually moved to California from New York uh, in 1956. This is a true story. We moved here because my sister had asthma, and the doctor said that moving to Los Angeles would be good for your asthma. <laughs> this is back in the day when they were recommending filters, cigarettes as a way to kind of toughen your lungs for the future. Uh, but for those of us who grew up during that era, the 60s was a time there were jobs. They were plentiful, and you could be a working class person making a middle class wage. California is now the fourth most unequal state in the United States. We are more unequal than Mississippi and Alabama, two places we've always looked to as beacons of social justice and opportunity. <laughs> so we've got a level of inequality that's problematic. <laughs> and this chart's a little difficult to explain, uh, but I'm going to tell you what it says um, without explaining it, the chart too much. Uh, so tries to look at income trajectories from the 80s, 90s, and now. And the top line, dashed line, is from 1989. And it's like what's likely to happen as you get older. So as you enter the labor market, you expect your wages won't be very high. But as you spend more time and acquire experience, what should happen? They should rise. It should peak you know, about the time that you retire. And then as you retire, your income will go down. And that's kind of that very well-behaved orange line. But when you look at 1999, 
it's a much lower run, right, to peak income. And when you look at the most lowest trajectory for 2012-2016 data, what you'll notice is that for millennials in particular, they are going to start at lower wages and they're never going to be as well off as the generation before unless we turn things around. Now, this is why this younger generation is so pissed at an older generation, right? Uh, they came of age during the Great Recession. Uh, they've been permanently dented in the labor market as a result of that. Just as they were beginning to recover, housing prices took off, so it looks like they can never buy a house. And then Trump was elected president, <laughs> right? Which, uh, some of you may be Trump supporters, but almost nobody under the age of 25 is. Uh, so there's this sense of the generations being uh, really uh, left behind. And this is a particular problem in uh, Culver City, uh, because what's gone on in Culver City, this is a long chart in median household income, is that your median household income is actually, used to be about, at the number in there, but apparently dropped, used to be about 33% higher than the county. Now it's about 45 to 50% higher than the county. So Culver City's become a more exclusive place over the time period. So uh, the other thing that I think is uh, quite relevant to pay attention to is that we've got a lot of uh, racial disparities in terms of income and we are in the process of reproducing them into the future through our educational system, which is why planning should take into account getting kids to school, what the intersection is with education, et cetera. What this shows you uh, by race, hard to see, is the percent of kids of each ethnic group in LA County that go to high poverty schools, where high poverty is defined as a school where more than 75% of the kids are on free and reduced lunch. A um, Little bit less than 10% of white kids go to high poverty schools, about 55% uh, of black kids go to high poverty schools, and two thirds of Latino kids go to high poverty schools. High poverty schools tend to have less resources, challenges with teachers, um, et cetera. So it's a recipe for reproduction into the future unless we begin to address it. Uh, last thing on this, and then I'll uh, move quickly to uh, I'd like a stirring and emotional conclusion. Uh, so, um, is the issue of rent. Uh, Los Angeles County has become particularly unaffordable. We are now the seventh most unaffordable rent market um, in the country relative to people's income. Uh, there's a significant difference in terms of the burden by race, and that burden is particularly sharp here in Culver City, where your household prices and rents have outpaced where the county's at. So that's a big problem. I'm gonna jump over this and talk about the last couple of trends to kind of keep in mind. So when I start thinking about building an inclusive city, we've talked a little bit about the de underlying demographic trends. We've talked about some real pessimism in terms of where the economy is headed, unless we do something about it. Uh, the last thing that I want to talk about is some of the social uh, possibilities that I think are out there. And I want to point to three and then come to a conclusion. Uh, they are the following. First thing, um, and the mayor mentioned it earlier, people beginning to address um, the issue of equity. And this is becoming increasingly important in planning, economic development, et cetera, for several reasons. Uh, one might be that people simply care about goodwill, but there's a big interesting revolution that's occurred in economic thinking. Um, and it's the following. Now, I always like to take people one step to this journey. So how many of you took economics in college? Okay. It can be brutal, right? 
Okay, so one of the first things we teach you in economics, I was trained as an economist, taught economics for 10 years. One of the first things we teach you is uh, supply and demand, right? And then we uh, teach you about the minimum wage, and we teach you that if you raise the minimum wage, what will happen? The, the employment will go down, right? And there's almost no evidence that that's true. There's a great book called Myth and Measurement, uh, which basically took that apart, a guy named David Card, and launched a whole new set of studies on the minimum wage. And basically, what's been shown, we'll see what happens with this big increase to $15 an hour, but moderate increases on the order of 35 to 40%. There's no evidence that there's disemployment impacts. In fact, there's some evidence in some cases is positive employment, maybe slight negative, just basically no impact. Now, why is that? When people make more money, they spend it. Uh, when uh, people uh, make more money, they feel more loyalty at work, so they work harder. Uh, when people are about to be paid a higher wage, employers tend to look for a better match. Instead of running through low-wage workers, they try to figure out who's actually going to work out. So it's pretty explicable. The other thing we teach you is that inequality might be something that liberals don't like, but it's good for economic growth. Because if we have inequality, we're going to have more savings, we're going to have more incentives for people to invent stuff and recoup profits. That is true at an extreme, meaning that if you were in the Soviet Union in 1980s and you quashed all incentives, you would definitely kill growth. But it's also the Wow, that was magic. Uh, the mayor is a very handy guy. I don't know whether this, like, are you elected mayor or is it a rotational thing on the council? It's both. So I think he, like, I'm going to move to Culver City and vote for him just for him doing this, right? So so it, it's the case that you also get off on the other side where a small group of people has too much of the income. Then you're going to squash consumer demand. You're going to create a lot of political conflict. You're not going to be able to agree on how to generate growth over time. And the basic thing is in the United States, we've probably gotten on the wrong side of that curve. Now, I know you might be looking at me and saying, I'm not sure I believe him. Uh, he's probably some leftist professor. And besides, all of you from UCLA don't trust me anyway. <laughs> I mean, why did he want to go to the west side anyway? Uh, so don't believe me. Believe that well-known left-leaning institution, the Cleveland Federal Reserve, <laughs> which did a study of metropolitan regions much the size of Cleveland, and they found that things that make a difference for growth that you might expect, like universities, hospitals, anchor institutions, skilled workforce, they make a difference. But if you have a lot of inequality and a lot of racial segregation, it tends to dampen growth. Another well-known Marxist organization, the International Monetary Fund, did a study looking at the economic growth trajectories of nations and found out, that was a little bit to their surprise, that the single biggest impediment to being able to sustain growth over time was the level of initial income inequality. Because it tended to create underinvestment in public education, tended to create a lot of political conflict, um, et cetera. So we did a book, Equity, Growth, and Community, where we actually uh, replicated the International Monetary Fund's findings, looking at metropolitan uh, areas in the United States. So the point here is that there's this sort of new thinking. It's no surprise to me that there's a call for thinking about more equitable development. It's partly about the values that people have, but it's also simply about how do you actually sustain development over time. I mean, think about it. If you have a lot of racial inequality, but all the kids are more kids of color and the people are retiring, are retiring, you need them to be more productive, you need to deal with the initial levels of income inequality. So two other things which I think are really crucial, I'm going to jump over a bunch of slides that are key uh, things for the future of planning. The transit reconfiguration of Los Angeles. I mean, you're experiencing it with the Expo line running through, far more successful than anybody ever thought. Um, and also, what's interesting about this, uh, for anybody who grew up in L.A., 
one thing you'll know is that the hardest people to get on mass transit are people who grew up in LA. Because our like DNA is like, it doesn't work, right? But newer people, younger people, immigrants, get on it. If you got on it too, you would realize it works. Uh, but it even goes to USC. Some of them UCLA are probably throwing spitballs out the window the whole time, but yes, it, it's a good shot to USC. So, but that's really reconfiguring our urban landscape. And it's gonna do a couple of things which I think are really crucial to Culver City. Um, you've already seen it with some of the transit-oriented stuff that's coming in. The gentrification pressures you think you face now are gonna be much worse. And they're gonna be much worse not simply because of the Expo line coming through Culver City, but because it's opening up South LA. Anyone, if you spend any time in South Los Angeles, one thing you're gonna notice is that this juncture between tattered boulevards, like you'll go down uh, big parts of uh, uh, Jefferson and you'll go, my, you know, it's really run down. And then if you drive in a block, you'll notice super well-maintained homes. So what's about to happen in South LA is a massive run-up in property values because as people start to use this line and get off and go, wow, if somebody actually invested in the boulevards, these homes are really pretty well-maintained and pretty precious. Um, that's gonna lead to even more pressures on the cities like Culver City, uh, Inglewood, et cetera. So those are big things to watch out for. <laughs> The other thing to, which I think is a big trend, is civic engagement. And I feel sorry for the cameraman, I'm moving around so much, but dude, that's just me. And I, I literally don't care, so. Uh, so, um, so, we tend to think about engagement as calling a meeting, asking people to come. Uh, that's probably what happened here. Uh, but we need to rethink engagement. So if you want people to participate in the general plan, you need to do two things. One is you need to go where people are, not where you want them to be. So daycare centers, ESL classes, places where people don't think about planning, but it's actually a crucial part of their lives. Second thing, you need to make it a maker's process, not a taker's process. What do I mean by that? Young people in particular don't want to consume, they want to produce. So listening to me talk, which is delightful, I'm sure, is not the same thing as coming up with some tools so people can do some planning and watch what happens to the level of houses, the level of jobs, transit, et cetera, real-time simulation stuff, which allows people to be makers and not simply receivers of knowledge that is, is made. That requires a very different kind of engagement. So for example, what I was gonna show you here is that we did a, a study on uh, transit and equity uh, in Southern California. And the way you normally do these things is you release you release a report, uh, you call a press conference, people receive the wisdom of the academics, then nothing happens. Uh, so what we did instead was we created a website, which was a website to which community-based organizations could contribute their stories around transit. And we did the first one, and then we created a platform with this KCET for people to contribute their stories, and therefore it became an interactive website with what people wanted to see happen in transit. So new forms of civic engagement are crucial. The last thing, which is a big trend, and then I'll conclude, is that there's a lot more need for indicator projects about equity that can help to measure progress and ensure accountability. There has been a tendency in the past to not want to talk about race, immigration, equity, inclusion. Partly in the United States, we've got a whole discomfort with talking about those things. Uh, 
for a variety of different reasons. Um, you know, often it's that white folks don't want to talk about it because they're afraid they'll say the wrong thing. People of color don't want to talk about it because we don't want that to be the only prism through which you see us and our individuality. But it's a little bit like the following thing. If you don't go to the gym, when you go to the gym, it's horrible. <laughs> if you go to the gym regularly, when you go to the gym, it's OK, right? Because you're exercising that muscle over and over again. If you avoid these conversations around equity and diversity and inclusion, you're not going to develop the muscle to have the conversation. Uh, now, like when you go to the gym, you might make some mistakes, lift a little bit too much. You might make some mistakes in the conversation, but unless you have the conversation, you're not going to develop the muscle. So part of that is developing ways that you build it into the general plan. So you ask the question, which groups are benefiting? Uh, which groups are bearing the burden? Uh, and how do we drive the data down to do that in ways that make sense? Um, so my last three points, and that really is the end, and then we'll do a conversation, um, is that what I would say is if you're trying to build a more equitable city, um, it has to be a fundamental starting point, not something you do afterwards. We often say, how am I going to build enough housing and then consider whether it's affordable? How am I going to do economic development and then figure out whether low-income people can get those jobs? It needs to be baked in, not sprinkled on. It needs to be a fundamental part of what you do first. Second, which is what I originally said just now, is that uh, what you measure matters. There's a bunch of things that matter that can never be measured, the love for your children, et cetera. But in planning, if you don't measure it, it doesn't matter. So if you don't say residential stability for renters is important, so we're going to think about how to make that happen. If you don't say that closing the achievement gap is important, so we're going to measure it, it's not going to matter. So building in measurement. And the last thing I'll say is that um, if you want to do this work of equity, um, expect that there will be challenges and noisiness and conflict and tension along the way. That that's just part of the process. If people feel like they've been left behind, their first entry points into a process might involve some dealing with that historic legacy and hearing that out about who's been left behind, who's been included, and what needs to move forward. We often uh, forget that conflict is actually part of our process of coming to collaboration. And with that, I'll simply point out that some people asked, was I going to talk about my new book, State of Resistance? I did not. However, you could buy it. Um, <laughs> It's right there. It's a very good book. Uh, and it talks a lot about a lot of these trends and changes in California writ large and how community organizing and fights for equity have been an important part. So thanks, and let's do a Q&A. So I, I have some great questions here that were provided by uh, Tevis Barnes, who's our fantastic uh, housing administrator here in Culver City. Uh, and I had I have some questions of my own, but I'm really I'm I'm really eager for this to become really a discussion with all of you and and make this more of a of a, uh, a makers session a participatory session than than uh, than than it might have been traditionally. But so let me just let me just run by some some quick questions some quick subjects that Tevis wanted to bring up. Rent control with Proposition 10 looming. Simply put, can rent control solve uh, our housing crisis here in Culver City? We don't have rent control here, and it's, and it's quite a subject of debate. So uh, conveniently, we just put out a report yesterday uh, called Rent Matters about this. Uh, and I would urge you to read it because it does something kind of rare, 
uh, it offers a nuanced understanding of rent control. Uh, so here's what's interesting. Here's what the literature says uh, about, and we actually in the paper talk about it as rent regulation because almost all, when you think about rent control, you tend to think about New York and frozen rents and stuff like that, and almost all modern forms of rent regulations uh, include permissible increases, uh, include some degree of vacancy decontrol, uh, and a number of other things. So here's what the literature actually, and the research actually says. Uh, rent regulation seems to have almost no impact on new construction. Uh, makes sense because almost all new construction isn't actually under rent stabilization. Uh, second, rent stabilization tends, does have an impact on condo conversion. That is, people taking apartments off the market and putting them into condominiums. Uh, you can do some rules around that to limit condo conversion, uh, if that's something that's uh, of appeal. Um, and it is notable that uh, recently in the Bay Area, the places that have put in rent regulations are not seeing condo conversion at a faster rate than the rest of the Bay Area. It's simply a big phenomenon going on in these kind of hot market areas. So that's a little mix too. Uh, rent uh, stabilization does tend to do uh, two things that you might expect. Uh, one is it tends to keep rents lower. Um, second uh, is it tends to lead to residential stability because people are not being pushed out by higher rents. Uh, and the thing that's kind of interesting about that, um, which I think is sort of an interest, so there's two things about rent that I think are really important uh, to realize. Uh, so first, what has happened to rents in Culver City? They've gone up, right? Gone up pretty dramatically. Has the quality of the housing changed any? No. So it's a little bit unlike like, I just bought this new iPhone. thing is way too expensive, but it's kind of worth the money, right? Uh, it's like a lot better um, than the old iPhone. So with most products, if the quality goes up, you pay more. With rent, there's a difference between building rent and land rent. So land rent, your landlords are making a lot of money because someone built a transit system around them. Someone encouraged a creative industry around them. But it wasn't really anything they did. They just happened to own the land. So the economists wind up thinking about this in a very different way. Moving back to residential stability. How many of you own a home? OK. How many of you, because of that, benefit from, the, if you still have a mortgage, the mortgage interest deduction? And we put that in because we value residential stability. How many of you bought your home more than five years ago? You're probably benefiting from Prop 13, which prevents your tax assessments from rising because we value residential stability. The only group we don't value residential stability for is low-income renters. But we've cared the entire housing market to value residential stability for uh, high-income, middle-income people who can buy property. I mean, be real. That's a stark contradiction. Here's the problem on the other side. If you think that rent regulations are going to solve the housing crisis, you're wrong. We need more affordable housing to be built. We actually also need more market rate housing so people can filter out of that. We need to streamline permitting we need to allow upzoning near transit because that's crucial both for using the transit climate and also just getting more housing in place. But for the life of me, I can't figure out why you would take one tool, rent regulation, out of that mix of tools. So that's where I come down to that, which is that it's a useful tool. But the question you ask is, is it going to solve our problems? It's not going to solve your problem. But why you would take the tool out of the toolbox is not clear to me. Great answer. Um, I have I have some more questions here and more discussion. But are there is there anybody out there with a with a burning desire? Can uh, I suggest we do one thing on the way? Sure, please. So you've been sitting a long time. Stand up.
and stretch. That's a key thing to do. You know, West Side Yoga class, come on. <laughs> so probably a lot of you are here with somebody you already know. Uh, take a few minutes. Find somebody that you don't know. I'm sure there's somebody here you don't know. Uh, maybe the mayor knows everyone. Uh, Not even. Find someone you don't know and take a couple of minutes. What sort of struck you or resonated or you went, wow, that's really useful uh, from what I presented uh, and useful for you thinking about general planning. And second, what was missing or you wish you'd heard or you think is really key to think about the plan? So what resonated, made sense, will be useful for thinking about planning, what was missing, what needed to be in the conversation for thinking about the Culver City general plan. Go, find someone, talk. <laughs> All right, folks, let's take our seats again. I think that worked great. And I know that uh, Nancy Barba had a burning question. Where can we go to read about models that have succeeded? So everything you presented is kind of like, oh, man. Like, oh, where can we go to learn about models, cities that have succeeded in implementing the right planning strategies that are in similar um, situations or countries. I mean, it doesn't have to be U.S. Anywhere that we can learn about this. Yeah, I mean, I'll uh, refer you to two different places. Uh, one is an organization called PolicyLink, uh, which is up in Oakland. And we do a lot of work with them. We run the back end of something called the National Equity Atlas data source. So we do the data. They do a lot of the uh, web and uh, policy stuff, and they're really a treasure trove of uh, thoughts about doing more inclusive development on all sorts of issues, housing, economic development, uh, planning generally. The second thing, and I uh, recommend this, uh, and I be, before recommending it, it is one of my books, but it is free. Um, that book I mentioned, Equity, Growth, and Community, is actually available as a free download from the University of California Press. Uh, it's an interesting thing. They were trying to see whether or not making free downloads would cannibalize or promote sales. Turns out, it's a little bit like everything else in the new markets, it actually promotes sales. Because the people who download it like it, and then they recommend it to people who want, like, how many of you just like, it's got to be paper or you won't read it, right? <laughs> exactly. So, dude, you can buy it. Uh, so. Uh, but uh, we actually there look at 11 case studies of places mostly getting it right. And what's interesting is they span, I mean, there's a couple of places that have much more conservative politics too, like Salt Lake City is actually a place, they've been a leader on, you know, they were the first people among the first to do the sort of housing first uh, approach to homelessness. They've done some very good stuff on, um, on environmental uh, planning, and they've done some remarkable stuff on immigrant integration, which you would not expect until you start thinking about the fact that, um, I mean, people might not know this, but Salt Lake Metro is gonna become majority people of color before the country does. And I know it's surprising, because when you think Salt Lake, you think not just white, but sort of shiny white, you know, sort of <laughs> book, book of Mormon white, right? Uh, but partly because of the Mormon missionary experience, they've been very welcoming of immigrants. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, they've done a remarkable job. So one of the things I think that's good in the, in the book is we actually also look at Oklahoma City, which is a very Republican area, but that supported tax increases to recover uh, the center city and close the black-white achievement gap for business reasons. So it's, we cover blue places as well, but what's nice is trying to think about how this works and can appeal because your city has a mix of perspectives. Yeah, we have, uh, I, I think there was one over here first, but uh, I think Policy Link, we've done a number of things with Policy Link. I think they have been involved in a, maybe a couple of different teams that are 
applying for our general plan. Thank you. Um, loved the presentation. I just want to start by saying that. Uh, so I've heard a lot of differing viewpoints about whether some new development should come into Culver City and how developers could be worked with. And so my question is, from your experience, what are ways that Culver City can negotiate with developers on behalf of the communities in an equitable way so that building equity into the developments, particularly in the housing developments, which might disproportionately affect certain schools over other schools, how can that be addressed at the ground level in the negotiations instead of being an afterthought? Well, uh, I'm sure you've heard of community benefits agreements, which are pre-negotiated agreements with developers. Um, and the people who've done comparative studies of them um, find that the ones that are the most effective, both in what they say at the front end in terms of implementation, are the ones that have a lot of grassroots community participation in the negotiation. So in New York City, where they were more top-down, they've been not very effective. In Los Angeles, where they were more bottom-up, and I'm taking a big literature and making it very simple, um, they've been more effective and there's been more accountability. So part of what I would say to you is, how can you in this planning process really encourage a lot of grassroots participation and build up community organizations that can be on the table along with the city, uh, talking about the things that are actually really needed. Okay. Um, a follow-up to uh, my neighbor's question to you about um, cities that are uh, doing it right that are like Culver City. And we're sort of like Signal Hill, surrounded by Long Beach, right? We're Culver City, surrounded by Los Angeles. The two examples you gave are actually in very small population states, and they're sort of their own kinds of cities. So are there any cities like ours that you think are doing it right? Gosh, what a great uh, question. I think it's your opportunity to lead. Uh, <laughs> you know, this might not be uh, a place that you would normally uh, think of, but it'd be interesting for you to spend a little bit of time talking to uh, folks in Compton. Um, because Compton is a city surrounded by a bunch of other cities, and it's got an amazing new mayor, uh, Asia Brown, uh, who has a planning degree from USC. Don't hold it against her. Uh, <laughs> who has, and when people think about Compton, the thing that comes to your mind, uh, corruption, people might think about a lot of problems. You know, what comes to my mind is, how can a small city that size uh, produce uh, NWA, Richard Sherman, uh, the Williams sisters, Kendrick Lamar, and Dr. Dre. Like, what is going on there, right? <laughs> so, uh, so I think one of the things to do is to think about other cities. Now, you have to be a more affluent city, surrounded by another kind of a city. Uh, and I would think that some of the places that are not perfect parallels, because they're not perfectly surrounded, uh, would be a mountain view. Uh, which has been trying to do some stuff around housing, uh, minimum wage, and a bunch of other things. Hi. Oh, it's working. I didn't hear it. Um, so I had two questions, one both related to what you had said for us to ask in our conversations. Um, the first was, as I was listening to your presentation, you were talking about diversity in the beginning. And my reaction was, this is really great that it, we're going to be a more diverse culture. And the first, my first, and my reaction to that was, well, this is great because a lot of people of color or whatever will rise up and be either affluent or middle class or whatever, and not be in the lower class. So, what I was confused by is, um, you tended to project it more as just the economic trends and such. So, is it overly optimistic to think? that maybe not even that it increases so that, so that it's more diverse, so there's more middle class, there's more wealthy, even if it stays where it is now, but it's a more diverse population. Is, that, is it naive to think of that, or is it just gonna be more wealthy white people and everybody else is gonna have the whatever's left? Um, so am I predicting complete dystopian disaster, or, yeah. So, you know, what I, 
really trying to say is that that's sort of up to us. Um, if we make our educational systems work, that's going to make a difference in terms of mobility into the middle class. If we uh, do housing so that we can house more diverse population, particularly of different income levels, that's going to help. So we're going to need another big breakthrough in our thinking, and it's the following thing. Many of us, when we think about economic development, tend to think about, I want to attract entertainment or uh, information technology or biotech. Those are the thriving key things in the market. Um, but the important thing to have in your mind uh, is behind every software programmer is an army of nannies and gardeners and food service workers. And just like I said, in my view, there's no contradiction between throwing down on streamlining, permitting, and moving affordable housing, and even building market housing, market rate housing, and having rent regulations. There's no contradiction in my mind between chasing high value industries and realizing that with that, you're going to have to create housing for service workers. You're going to have to raise the minimum wage. You're going to have to improve the rights for them to represent themselves in negotiations with employers, that those two things actually go together. So that's, that's the way I think we deal with this. The other thing, frankly, is that uh, the west side of Los Angeles has a unique opportunity to create jobs in advanced manufacturing. So that's a place where the middle of the labor market can grow over time. And one of the things about manufacturing, which is also crucial, is that um, it's actually been growing in recent years. Even if it wasn't growing that much, it's got a really old workforce. Because that big deindustrialization tended to lay off newer workers who are predominantly black and Latino first kept older white workers, but now they're aging out. And so there's a lot of opportunities in manufacturing as well. Is that um, a great one, question? One other quick question, and that is the trickle-down economic theory, does that not address the idea? I mean, it seems to me that, that the concept that people have been operating under at least the last 30 or 40 years was that people earn more money, they spend more money, it generates the economy, and the economy, it, I always have heard, it's consumer driven. So does the trickle down economic theory not operate under that or? Well, a couple things. So first, how's that working for you? Uh, <laughs> the second, I mean, it's important to know that three years ago, the Republican Congress commissioned a study on the impacts of tax cuts whether or not they spur economic growth. Um, and they commissioned the Congressional Research Service, their internal service, to do the report. So they did, and they concluded that tax cuts do not increase economic growth. I don't know how many of you have seen that study. Probably haven't, because they refused to release it. So, you know, and it, one of the problems with the way we've been uh, engaging in, I mean, the logic of, again, at an extreme, uh, too much redistribution will quell economic growth. Some degree of inequality in a market society is both the result of the market, but it's also a driver of the market. Uh, but when you move to a situation in which, so for example, you know, again, you might have a different opinion, with this gigantic tax cut, I guess it's 85% of it is going to the top, a couple percent, um, who are not likely to spend it. Because they mostly save. Because at a certain point, there's just so much you can buy. Whereas when you increase the minimum wage at the bottom of the labor market, 
every dollar is going back into the economy into some other product. If you could, for renters, reduce their rent burden as a share of their income, almost all of that's going to pump up small businesses in Culver City because that's what people are going to spend their money on. So we really need to rethink these old economic shibboleths that, again, I'm an economist. I was trained like that, too. I was raised on that. And then I started doing, like, this really remarkable, radical thing. I started looking at evidence. <laughs> and by the way, like I said, with the rent stabilization thing, um, some of the people who think that rent control will solve the crisis, they're off. They're not looking at the evidence. So it's like, how do we create an evidence-driven approach? Maybe one or two last questions before my voice disappears. Dr. Bastor, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm curious to know your opinion on the impact short-term rentals would have on a city. You guys are really asking easy questions. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's going to require a little bit more actual study. And unfortunately, it's probably going to require more of them happening for people to get the data points. I think there's a a big concern about them removing long-term rent rental units off the market. Uh, and then there's a, a big quality of life concern about people who live near them and how many people are in and out. So uh, it's, uh, it's hard to know right now. Uh, um, thank you so much for this. I, I was curious if you uh, have done any research or could say anything about the interaction between policing and equity and its interaction with the economy, jobs, and housing? Um, so first, just in order to uh, assuage any concerns, both my kids went to UCLA. <laughs> I think mostly because they knew that there was a tuition remission if they went to USC, so... It's like, Dad, you're going to throw down on this one. Um, so a couple of things. Um, so the, I mean, over-policing and criminalization uh, creates a lot of problems for people being able to uh, be successful in school and get into the labor market, et cetera. But the biggest thing that that raises for me right now I kind of feel like something fundamental has happened in a lot of America, really, certainly in California. We've realized that uh, our policing has been excessive. We've realized that it's been racially disparate, which, by the way, all you need to do is take a look at the data and realize that the incarceration rate for black males is about five times what it is for white males. For Latino males, it's about two and a half times. Uh, we've kind of realized it's expensive. Like, you could buy a couple of years at UC for each year we're keeping somebody in prison. We've kind of realized that arresting people for drug use is pretty irrational compared to delivering treatment. Part of what's driven that is that now the drug use is opioids in the Midwest, and people are going, my God, white people being arrested. This is a terrible thing. Um, this is obviously a public health problem. Um, so we're waking up. Here's the problem. We caused a lot of damage along the way. So about 25% of black males between 25 and 35 are carrying around uh, incarceration record, which makes it difficult for them to re-enter into the labor market. We in California have made a commitment to de-incarceration. California voters overwhelmingly passed Prop 47, which defelonized drug use and has begun to reduce the state prison population. But we haven't made the full investments in re-entry programs. And that's where I think um, that thinking about how people can successfully re-enter into the labor market is the sort of frontier challenge. It's one to which Culver City could contribute. Um, 
So maybe one last question and I'll close. One last question, then we were going to talk a little bit about Pasadena, maybe. Let's see. Okay. Well, I was so um, I can't see you on that side. Just the, the, the relationship between, because we're going into the general plan, the relationship between our land use and schooling, because so much is, is, is um, of our, um, you know, of, of, of people that are moving into our community um, do so because they believe their schools are great. Um, and when we have a land use conversation, um, we are affecting, obviously, many things that affect schooling. So you mentioned earlier about the, 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 the facts regarding the percentage of students that are in, in schools that are more diverse. Can you speak a little bit or give us guidance about how we should uh, think about as we go forward in, in, in planning um, and how it, the relationship with schooling? Yeah, my understanding the president of the school board is here, is that? Vice President. Vice president. Okay, so all love to you, sister. That's and to teachers. My wife is a principal. I don't principal. She's the superintendent of the Lawndale Elementary School District. So, um, so the, the the guidance I would give is um, the following. I'll do it by way of analogy. So, uh, over the last couple of years, we've formed a pretty close relationship with Metro. Um, and I was asked to come in and talk to Metro about what are measures uh, to measure equity around transit. And uh, I kept coming back to housing. And they said, well, you know, we do transit, we don't do housing. And I kept coming back to housing. I said, you know, but our thing is transit. We don't do housing. That's like someone else's job. Uh, and I said, you know, you're the single biggest driver of housing in Southern California right now is where you're laying out these lines and where developers go and the land that you've got around it. So the idea that you're not responsible is irresponsible. So that's the challenge with the planning process. The planning process needs to consider the articulation with schools. First, are you creating enough housing for young families? so that you can continue to have the ADA, the average daily attendance that will pay for the schools. Um, are you doing joint use agreements with the schools? So if a community is short on park space or community meeting space, they can use the school for that, um, et cetera. So there's a whole lot of sort of ways in which this articulation of planning and schools will be crucial. The last thing about schools is are you creating a homegrown population that will be able to come back and occupy the good jobs in the community by launching people successfully to community colleges and colleges? Um, and that's, I think, a crucial measure as well. So there's going to be a lot of stuff that comes up in the planning process where planners will say, well, that's not what we do. Planners do everything. They can do everything. It has impact on everything. Terrific. We, we were going to close out by you, you wanted to talk a little bit about Pasadena and the planning process there and how we might uh, engage with them. So yeah, um, one of the reasons I think this wasn't the reason why I was asked to talk, but it's one of the reasons why I agreed to talk. Um, back in the early 1990s, Pasadena, which is a little bit, it's not, it's not quite Culver City, it's, it's bigger, it's surrounded by a bunch of other cities, but some of its similarities have to do with a transit line running through it. Uh, big economic divergences within the community, a number of other things. They decided to revise their general plan. And the reason they did was they had been, voters had passed a slow growth ordinance in reaction to skyrocketing growth. And the city was 
sued by the Chamber of Commerce and the Urban League. The Chamber is saying this denies business opportunities. The Urban League is saying it denies opportunities for low-income people of color, particularly African-Americans. And the city of Pasadena said, well, you know, what if we revised the general plan in a way that met a lot of multiple interests? Would you back off the lawsuit? And the people suing the city agreed they would hold off for a year. And the city of Pasadena revised its general plan in one year. And they did it in an interesting way. They were, this early 1990s, they uh, normally would have hired consultants who do technical work to do technical work for them. They said, we can do all that technical work. We just don't know how to talk to human beings. So they hired a group of us, a group called MIT in Berkeley, and I was a subcontractor on it, to create community participation in the general plan. I was asked in particular to enhance the diversity. And we went from the beginning of the general plan, this is a pretty diverse audience, but we went from the beginning of the general plan in Pasadena, being about 10% people of color, to by the end of the general plan being 40% people of color participating. Still a little short, because the community at that time was about 55% people of color, but 10 to 40, big game. And the way we did it was the way that I described. We brought the uh, news about the general plan to daycare centers and ESL classes. We did another interesting thing. We said, we're going to have meetings in the community. But we're going to, your community meeting will actually be a community meeting with another neighborhood. So we brought people from an area called Bungalow Heaven, kind of white, gentrifying. And their meeting was in Northwest Pasadena, stressed African American with Hispanic and Latinos. But that was their community meeting. So they actually had to meet people from other parts of the city, just like I made you meet people tonight. And they began to realize that what they wanted could hurt other people. That they actually kind of grew to like in this meeting. And that maybe if they considered sort of a modification of their own interests, they could meet someone else's interests and their interests as well. We also did a lot of education around the general plan. But we deliberately did none of it around things that people already knew something about planning would be interested in. We did it around housing and economic development because we wanted to attract people who had never been part of planning before. So we weren't worried about people who normally came. We were worried about people who never came. So by the end of the process, Pasadena has had at that time about 125,000 people. Uh, 3,000 people had participated in the planning process in one way or another. The other thing we did was we created plan in a box. So if you were a local community group and you wanted to get your views in, you could go and train on how to run a charrette or run a meeting. And then you could go get plan in a box, take it to your community, collect information and bring it back to the general plan. We created makers, not diggers. You now know Pasadena. It's got that beautiful old Pasadena area. Didn't have it. It's got a lot of agreement around doing housing near transit. Didn't have it. Had a lot, has a lot of agreement around protecting single family housing in certain neighborhoods. It has that without denying housing and economic development where it needs to occur. So the thing I would encourage you is focus on participation. Anybody remember that movie, Casablanca? And at the end, the uh, detective says, round up the usual suspects. 
round up the unusual suspects. Try to figure out who's not participating and create a program that will bring them in. Get neighbors to actually meet each other so that you realize that your desire to not have a daycare center next to you means that people you know won't have a place to take their children. And that maybe a little bit of inconvenience for you is better for everyone if it's not abstract, if it's someone you actually met. So the, those are the lessons I pull away and then I would leave you with. So thank you. Well, I, who among you would, would join me in, in inviting uh, Dr. Pastor to be an honorary Culver citizen? <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Let's get all those folks to come. I'm going to go take apart the technology now.